The causes of the tragic Champlain Tower South building collapse in Miami, Florida may be becoming clearer, with evidence and testimony from various experts pointing to key weaknesses in the building structure. Here are the details. 11 people have been confirmed dead and 150 people are unaccounted for after a residential building collapsed in Surfside, Florida on Thursday, according to CNN. The cause of the collapse is not yet known. However, a 2018 engineer's report described the flat surface around the pool deck as a major error because it allowed water to build up on top of it. The buildup caused major structural damage to the concrete slab below, according to the report. Inside the parking garage beneath the pool deck, the report noted both cracks in the columns and cracks to the ceiling, with some previous repairs to these cracks deemed unsuccessful due to poor workmanship. This account was corroborated by a commercial pool contractor who saw significant water damage directly below the pool just 36 hours before the collapse, according to the Miami Herald. The contractor said he also saw large pools of standing water in the parking garage and was told by one building employee that they pumped the pool equipment room so frequently that pump motors had to be replaced every two years. The building structure may also have been affected by the fact that it had been sinking at a rate of 2 millimeters per year in the 1990s, according to a Florida International University study published in the Ocean and Coastal Management Journal. However, the study's author was cautious about declaring this a cause of the collapse. According to the Miami Herald, moments before the collapse, a woman who was inside told her husband on the phone that she had seen a sinkhole form where the pool used to be outside her window. Six engineering experts interviewed by the newspaper said that based on publicly available evidence, a structural column or concrete slab beneath the pool deck likely gave way first. Five days on from the collapse, the rescue effort continues, with rescuers having arrived from Israel and Mexico to help with the operation, according to the BBC. Machinery has moved large slabs, and a trench measuring 125 feet long and 40 feet deep has been built to help reveal any potential air pockets in the wreckage. The rescue process itself is a delicate operation, because moving large pieces of wreckage can affect other large pieces of wreckage, according to one retired fire chief who spoke to CNN. You don't want to cause more damage if they are, in fact, alive there, he said. Meanwhile, a wider discussion about building safety in the area is already underway. The vice mayor of Sunny Isles Beach, the city in which the building was located, told CNN there are plans to check 59 buildings nearby that are around the same age as the one that collapsed. What's more, the first individual lawsuit has already been filed against the Champlain Tower South Condominium Association by a resident who survived the collapse, according to CNN. The resident's attorney said his client is looking for an undisclosed amount of financial compensation as well as a jury trial. Both of those moves came as awkward new details about the building's safety history continued to come to light. According to minutes from a November 2018 board meeting seen by the Miami Herald, a month after the 2018 engineer's report noted major structural damage to the building, the chief building official for the town of Surfside told residents it was in very good shape. Asked about it this week, he said, I don't know anything about it. That's 2018. Quite clearly, there are questions to be asked of local authorities and the building's board. However, accountability for the disaster may take a long time to achieve. At a press conference on Monday, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis said an investigation conducted by the National Institute of Standards and Technology would take a long time, and some of those involved in building management are already making their cases. According to the New York Times, a lawyer representing the condominium association that runs the building said Saturday that its board had taken out a $12 million line of credit to pay for the repairs recommended in the 2018 engineer's report, which, furthermore, the Miami Herald says was actually commissioned three years in advance of a required 40-year recertification process. Work on the roof had in fact already begun at the time of the collapse. Regarding the timing of the repairs, the condominium association's lawyer insisted the board had not been warned in the 2018 report that any existing damage to the building made it unsafe. If there was anything in that report that really outlined that the building was in danger of collapse or there was a hazardous condition, would the board and their families be living there? The lawyer asked. According to the New York Times, one board member is missing in the collapse, as are her adult children. However, the authors of the 2018 engineer's report have also had their say on the collapse. Defending its work, Morabito Consultants said, Among other things, our report detailed significant cracks and breaks in the concrete, which required repairs to ensure the safety of the residents and the public. 
Morabito's report said most of the concrete deterioration in the parking garage needs to be repaired in a timely fashion, but did not suggest any collapse was imminent. Responsibility in these situations is a complicated and complex concept. More than one thing has gone wrong for something this catastrophic to take place. Individuals will have to answer questions, but intersecting systems must be interrogated too. On Monday, Miami-Dade County Mayor Daniela Levine Cava vowed to get to the bottom of what went wrong. And when questioned by CNN over whether Florida was a state in which real estate developers have more power than regulators, she was clear: "I know there's going to be changes in the law. There will be changes at the state and at the county and the city levels." And we have already started to the initiation of some changes that we could take administratively, and I know our county commission is going to be taking action. Tragedies often operate as turning points for poor systems, and the Miami-Dade County mayor made that point explicitly. We have the best building code possible based on Hurricane Andrew's lessons learned. Sad but true. We're going to learn from this devastating experience as well. Officials involved in that process may be able to consult with their equivalents in Mexico City. At least 24 people have died as a result of an overpass collapsing in Mexico City, according to the New York Times. Occurring at 10:22 p.m. near the Olivo Station in Mexico City Metro Line 12, the collapse sent two carriages of a passenger train crashing towards the busy roads below the overpass. The BBC notes that residents had previously reported cracks in the overpass structure after an earthquake in 2017, though transport authorities made repairs following the reports, according to Mexico's El Universal newspaper. We only heard a thunderous noise, and everything started coming apart. One survivor told El Universal, according to the Guardian, "We were sent flying and hit the ceiling." She said, "As of this morning, at least 79 people have been hospitalized as a result of the incident, according to CNN, citing Mexican officials. Four bodies remain inside the train's carriages." At a press conference on Tuesday, Mexico City Mayor Claudia Sheinbaum said that two investigations will be launched into the collapse. One by the Attorney General and one by an external company specializing in metros and structural issues. Mexico City is a massive expanse of a city, and it's infamous for being the most populous metropolis in North America. This massive city is sinking fast under its own weight and has already sunk too low to be saved. Here are the details. A new study published in the journal JGR Solid Earth reports that Mexico City is sinking at an unstoppable rate, with some parts sinking up to 50 centimeters per year over the past few decades. The massive city was built on a dry lake bed that contains water aquifers, which have held up the city in the past. But centuries of pumping water from these aquifers have made them so empty that the surrounding clay sheets are cracking and compressing. If the rate of sinking continues, it would lead to the contamination of drinking water for the city's 21 million people. More than three quarters of the city's drinking water comes from wells that extract water from the ground and continue to deplete its aquifers. Experts first noticed the sinking in 1900, when subsidence was recorded to be about nine centimeters a year. Drilling for groundwater wasn't capped until the late 1950s, by which time the city was sinking at a rate of 28 centimeters a year. This cap initially slowed the rate of subsidence, but the sinking accelerated again as the city's population and buildings increased exponentially. Geotechnical engineer Eddie Bromhead from Kingston University of London told the Guardian, "If you put heavy buildings on that kind of ground and used shallow foundations, the soil compacts. So that, along with removing the water, is why Mexico City is such a mess." Tragedy struck on the first day of Taiwan's tomb sweeping holiday when dozens of people were killed in the country's worst train crash in decades. Here's what happened. 50 people died and 202 people were injured on the morning of Friday, April 2nd, when the 408 Taroko Express train, bound for Taichung County in southeastern Taiwan, struck a crane truck that had rolled onto its track near the Qingshui Tunnel in Hualien County. Taiwan Central News Agency reported that the truck is likely to have rolled down a grassy slope next to the track only 15 minutes before the collision, because an earlier train, the Zhejiang Limited Express, had passed by the same track position at 9:13 a.m. and the Taroko Express was derailed at 9:28 a.m. According to the reporter, the busy train was carrying 498 people, including four train staff, when it hit the truck. With only 372 seats available for passengers, 122 people would have been standing. At the time of the crash, the train was likely to have been traveling at around 80 miles or 130 kilometers per hour. The CNA, citing data from the train security cameras, reported that the train's driver would have had only 6.9 seconds to brake as he emerged from the nearby Hejen Tunnel, only 250 meters from the truck. 
United Daily News' account of the collision itself describes how the train's eighth carriage hit the truck just in front of the Qingshui Tunnel, then derailed, crushing against the left side wall of the tunnel. The next three carriages were also derailed and crushed to varying degrees, and in combination, these four carriages make up almost all of the casualties. Citing the Central Disaster Response Center in Taiwan, the reporter broke down the casualties as follows. 28 people died in the eighth carriage, one died in the seventh, two in the sixth, and four in the fifth and fourth carriages. One person also died in the third carriage and other bodies were found outside the carriages. In the aftermath of the incident, thoughts have now turned to who should take responsibility for it. The truck's driver and the construction director of the six-year railway safety improvement project at a site 20 meters above where the crash occurred, Li Yi Sheng, issued a public apology for the incident on Sunday, and there have also been calls for a wider review of train safety in Taiwan. For more news animations and explainers, hit the subscribe and bell button to join the Tomo News family. Thanks for watching.